Hi and welcome to another GCSE History Revision video. In this video we're going to focus on paper one, the medicine paper, and it's going to be an overview of the British sector of the Western Front from 1914 to 1918. Let's start with a quick overview of the key locations of the British sector of the Western Front. There are four areas you need to know about. Ypres, the Somme, Arras and Cambrai. Let's look at our first location, Ypres. Ypres was a key area of fighting during World War I. The Germans had the high ground and that meant they could see the Allied's movements and it gave them advantage. The British were forced to build their trenches in the low-lying, waterlogged and muddy ground which was a disadvantage. Ypres was also a salient which means a battlefield area surrounded on three sides by the enemy which made it very difficult to attack. There were three battles that took place in Ypres. The first, very early on in the war in 1914. The second, in 1915. Now it's the second battle of Ypres that we need to know about because this was the first time that gas was used as a weapon. And it was the Germans who used chlorine gas in the second battle of Ypres against the British. We also need to know about the third battle of Ypres that took place in 1917, later on in the war. This is also known as Passchendaele. Now the reason we need to know about this particular battle is that the battle was fought under extreme conditions. There had been a lot of rain and the ground became waterlogged and incredibly muddy. In fact, many men fell and drowned in the mud and the British had a total of 245,000 casualties. Let's now look at the Somme. And the Somme is important for us to know about because of one famous battle that took place there in 1916, which is, of course, the Battle of the Somme. Now, the reason that this battle is so important for us to know about is because of the high casualty rate. In fact, 60,000 British casualties and 20,000 men died just on the first day of battle. This was a huge loss for the British army, especially in a first day of a battle. In fact, the whole battle had a huge casualty rate with 400,000 allied casualties in total. And this put a lot of pressure on the medical services. And this is important for you to know if you come across a source just about the Somme in your exam. We're now gonna look at Arras. Now Arras is unusual, very different from the rest of the Western Front. It had chalky terrain, not muddy. And that meant that the allied soldiers could dig a lot more. In fact, they dug a network of tunnels below Arras. That meant they could build underground rooms with running water, electricity, and all of this was used to keep their soldiers safe and also to hide what they were doing from the Germans. In fact, they even built an underground hospital in Arras and fitted it with 700 beds and this was all in preparation for a huge battle. Now the Battle of Arras took place in 1917 and despite all of their preparations and their use of underground tunnelling, the British still suffered 160,000 casualties. Let's look at our last location, Cambrai. Now Cambrai is important for two reasons. The first is medical and that's because Robertson set up a blood bank at Cambrai before the Battle of Cambrai in 1917. This meant there was going to be enough blood supplies for transfusions for injured soldiers. The other reason it's really important is because this is the first major use of tanks and 450 tanks were used by the Allies to launch a surprise attack on the Germans. And at first this was really successful and it allowed the Allies to gain quite a lot of land from the Germans. But unfortunately this land was then quickly lost and that's because they didn't have enough soldiers and infantry to support the tanks. 
Let's do an overview of the evacuation route. This was a system put in place by the army to rescue and treat wounded soldiers. The stretcher bearers played a key role. They fetched the wounded from the trenches and no man's land. They carried very basic medical supplies and worked in very dangerous conditions, often under fire. They faced lots of problems. They were limited by the supplies they had Mainly it was only morphine for pain relief and bandages to quickly bandage up the wound. At the start of the war, there just weren't enough stretcher bearers, usually only about 16 per battalion of a thousand men. They could work in really muddy conditions, especially in some areas of the Western Front like Ypres. And this made their work even harder and it could take six to eight bearers just to carry one stretcher. And this would slow them down, and it meant that in some cases, the injured had to wait hours or even days to be rescued. Another part of the evacuation route was the regimental aid post, or RAP. This was normally in the front line trench or as close behind it as possible. It would normally be in a dugout, or sometimes behind a wall. It was run by a battalion medical officer and they would bandage minor wounds and send soldiers back to the front if possible. For more severe wounds, they would give pain relief and then send them on to the dressing stations. The RAP had some problems. It was often poorly lit and dirty, which meant infections could occur. It was very dangerous being so close to the front line and under fire. And you'd only have one medical officer per battalion at the start of the war, which would mean he would be incredibly busy during battles. He would be supported by a small team of assistants of mainly stretcher bearers. Another part of the evacuation route was the field ambulance and dressing station. Now this would have been run by the Royal Army Medical Corps. Now field ambulances are actually mobile teams of medical professionals such as doctors and assistants and from 1915 they were also nurses involved. They would be brought in just before a battle to set up dressing stations and these would be set up in tents or derelict buildings about a mile behind the front line where it was a little bit safer. They would mainly treat wounded soldiers by dressing their wounds, hence the name dressing stations, and then they would send on more severe cases to casualty clearing stations, either by motor or horse-drawn ambulance. There was one key problem that the dressing stations faced, especially at the start of the war. There just wasn't enough ambulances to take the wounded from the dressing stations to the casualty clearing stations. And because of this, that meant major delays for treatment, which could cost lives. Let's look at the casualty clearing station in a little bit more detail. These were often in large tents or huts, and they would be quite far back from the front line, around 10 miles from the front. They would have been run by teams of doctors and nurses, and this is where operations would happen, especially emergency operations like amputations. They had operating theatres, mobile x-ray machines, as well as other resources. They used a triage system to divide the casualties into categories, such as minor wounds, critical wounds, or hopeless cases. Now, depending on which category you ended up in, that would determine how quickly you would be treated and the type of treatment you would receive. The casualty clearing station like every part of the evacuation route, had its problems. It could deal with about a thousand patients at a time, but that meant it would easily become overwhelmed, especially during the start of the war. Finally, let's look at the last part of the evacuation route, and that was the base hospitals. These were civilian hospitals far from the front, often close to railway lines. They received their serious cases from the casualty clearing stations, either by train, motor ambulance, or even barge. They had teams of doctors and surgeons, and here 
more advanced operations could be done and they would treat the severely injured. They could treat up to 2,500 patients, so they had a higher capacity than casualty clearing stations. And they had amazing resources like laboratories um, to identify infections, x-ray departments, and some even had specialist centres for treating certain injuries like gas injuries. Like every part of the evacuation route, it had its problems, and the main problem was that transport from the casualty clearing stations to the base hospitals was often, especially at the start of the war, slow and incredibly painful, and that led to a time delay in getting to base hospitals, which could have terrible effects on the wounded soldiers and even cost lives. Let's do an overview of the injuries that soldiers received while fighting in World War One. A key point for us to remember is that weapons caused injuries. I'm going to start by looking at war wounds. The type of wound would vary depending on where in the body the wound was occurred. So whether it was the head, the face or other parts of the body. The key thing they had in common is blood loss was a real problem, especially if soldiers didn't receive treatment in time. It was caused by the different weaponry, and I've given you a couple of examples there. Treatment would vary depending on where in the body the wound was received and how bad it was, but one treatment could be amputation of a limb. The army did, as the war went on, try to prevent war wounds, and one example is how they issued the soldiers with steel helmets to protect their heads. Another problem that the army faced that was a real issue was infection. Now the risk of infection increased during the war and that was due to the conditions that many of the soldiers received their wounds in. Gas gangrene was a particular problem and that was caused by bacteria that was in the soil getting into the wound and it could make the wound swell and smell and even turn colour. The army and the medics did try and keep wounds as clean as possible, but again, due to the conditions they were treating the soldiers in, it meant that antiseptic dressings were just not effective. And therefore, when it came to treatment, they were often dealing with soldiers that already had an infection. And there's just two examples there that we'll talk about in a little more detail in a later slide. And another key injury that soldiers received was as a result of the use of poison gas such as chlorine, phosphine or mustard gas. They caused all sorts of problems like temporary blindness or skin irritation and even coughing and often they were treated by just first of all washing the gas off the skin or giving a soldier oxygen. Soldiers did not have any protection against gas in 1915 when it first occurred and so many resorted to urinating on their hankies and holding it over their faces. But from July 1915 the army realised they needed to give more protection and gas masks were issued. Let's look at the illnesses that soldiers received and a key point for us to remember here is that it was the conditions that the soldiers were fighting in that caused disease. We'll look at trench fever. Now this was caused by body lice that were often in the clothing and the blankets used by soldiers on the Western Front. It caused flu-like symptoms and left soldiers too weak to fight. The army tried lots of different methods of treatment like drugs like quinine and salvacin 606 but these were found to be ineffective. And eventually they started to use um, a method of passing electric currents through different areas of the body and that had a little bit more success. The army even tried to prevent trench fever and they did this through a program to try and disinfect clothing and wash clothing on a more regular basis. But even by 1918, 15% of men in the army were seen as unfit for duty due to trench fever. So it continued to be a problem. Another illness that the army faced was trench foot. Now this was caused by the damp, wet trench conditions. 
Many trenches would become waterlogged, and so soldiers' boots and socks were constantly wet or damp. Now this caused numb, swollen, painful feet. It would even cause, cause blistering, and in some cases, gangrene, which is a particularly nasty form of infection. Most treatments just involved cleaning and drying the feet. With really bad cases of gangrene, soldiers had their toes and even their feet amputated. Prevention became very important and so the army encouraged soldiers to change their socks twice a day and they would even do foot inspections to look at their soldiers' feet to make sure they were changing their socks regularly. Whale oil was even used to rub into the feet to protect it. Finally, there was shell shock. Now, this was a psychological illness and it was caused by the horrible stress of fighting on the Western Front. It caused all sorts of symptoms, including tiredness, nightmares, shaking. And the army really did not understand shell shock and they even thought it might be contagious. And in some cases, soldiers were not treated with sympathy. Eventually, though, the army realised that it could be treated with rest away from the front line and good food. And some hospitals were even developed to become specialist centres just to treat shell shock. Approximately, according to the records, there, are eight, there were 80,000 cases of shell shock, but it's more likely to be much more than that. Let's do an overview of the improvements in surgery and treatment. Let's start by looking at how the treatment of infection improved. Now there's two reasons why infection was a particular problem in surgery. Firstly, aseptic surgery was impossible. Another reason why it was important is that soldiers were already infected with fragments of mud and clothing in the wounds by the time they were treated. So surgeons had to find a way of dealing effectively with infection. One method they used was debridement, which is to cut away damaged and infected tissue from a wound. Now this needed to be done as soon as possible because infection could spread really quickly. And if any infected tissue had not been removed before the wound was stitched, the infection would just spread again. They did develop a method during World War I called the Carol Dakin method, and this was used more widely from 1917. This meant putting a sterilised salt solution into the wound through a tube to try and keep the wound clean. There were issues though. Unfortunately, the solution would only last for about six hours and it had to be made when it was needed. Now this could be really difficult, especially when large numbers of wounded men needed treatment at the same time. However, amputation was still used if no other solution worked. The impact is, as the war wore on, there was a reduction in amputation operations. But by 1918, 240,000 men had lost limbs. And so infection continued to be a bit of an issue. Right, we're now going to look at a method that was used to try and stop blood loss. Now, there was a particular problem because gunshots and shrapnel wounds often caused something called a compound fracture, which is when a broken bone pierces the skin. Now, these type of breaks are very nasty because they can cause major blood loss. And at the start of the war, only 20% of men who received these injuries would survive. So a solution was found, and that was called the Thomas splint. And you can see it in the image on your screen. It was a kind of brace that pulled the leg straight to stop bones grinding against each other and to reduce bleeding. It was taught to all medical officers at the regimental aid posts and dressing stations so that they could use it when they saw a compound fracture. It had a big impact. 
because the use of the Thomas splint prevented bleeding while the patient was being transported to the casualty clearing station for surgery. And the survival rate increased dramatically from 20% to 82%. So this was a very effective improvement. Let's look at how blood transfusions were developed during World War I. Transfusions had to be done person to person at the start of the war, and obviously that wasn't possible near battlefields. The other issue was that storing blood was impossible because blood clots up when it leaves the body. So quite a few solutions were needed, especially they had to find a way of how blood could be stored. And this was done through different stages. In 1915, they uh, added sodium citrate to blood, and that allowed blood to be stored for up to two days. And in 1916, citrate glucose was added to blood, and that allowed blood to be stored for up to four weeks. Then this meant that governments could now start to set up blood banks, and this led to the first blood bank before a battle at Cambrai in 1917. And they even discovered how to create a portable machine that could store blood so that it could be used much nearer the front line. Another area that improved was x-ray machines. At the start of the war, there just weren't enough x-ray machines. And those they did have tended to overheat really quickly and they'd have to be left to cool down. That meant that it wasn't possible to x-ray many soldiers. Solutions had to be found, and the first one is that the governments had to produce and buy more x-ray machines. Another one was that they found a way of making x-ray machines mobile by transporting them around in trucks. The impact this had was that by 1916, most casualty clearing stations had their own x-ray machines, and all base hospital did as well. And this would mean that more soldiers could receive or have an x-ray. That meant that more soldiers could be treated um, very quickly with fragments of bullet and shrapnel located in their bodies really quickly and therefore removed. Another area of surgery that developed was plastic surgery. At the start of the war, surgeons lacked experience at dealing with facial wounds. So the solution was to develop techniques in order to reconstruct soldiers' faces after they'd suffered from terrible facial wounds. By 1915, a method called skin graft had been developed. And this was covering wounds using skin from other parts of the body. Now a key individual in this method was a surgeon called Harold Gillies and he set up a specialist centre for facial wounds in Queen's Hospital in Kent. Now the impact of this is that as early as 1915, 11,000 reconstructive operations had been completed. By the end of the war. This meant thousands of men with facial wounds had been treated. And finally, there were improvements in brain surgery. Now, brain surgery was not carried out often at the start of the war, and that's because it's a very lengthy, complex, and dangerous surgery to do, and often patients would not survive. But during World War I, so many soldiers received head wounds that surgeons had to improve and develop brain surgery. One way they did this was thanks to the work of individuals like Harvey Cushing, and he came across a surgical magnet that could be used to remove metal fragments from the brain in a way that was safe. Other surgeons discovered that using rubber bands on heads could limit bleeding and therefore mean the patient was more likely to survive and they also realized that local anesthetic should be used in brain surgery instead of general anesthetic and this was to prevent brain from swelling. Let's do some exam focus. Here is a key features question from a previous exam. 
It's worth four marks and you may want to quickly pause the video to read it. Like all key features question, it asks you to describe two features of something in particular. In this case, two features of the work of stretcher bearers. On the screen are two answers by two separate exam candidates. Which of these examples do you think would get four marks? Pause the video now to read both candidates' answers and decide which one you think should get four marks and why. Both candidates have given two correct features of the work of stretcher bearers. However, it is the second answer that would get four marks because they have supported each feature with specific information and detail. Now it's time for you to have a go. On the screen are a list of key features questions. You might want to quickly pause the video and choose a question to try. But before you do, remember that you are being asked to give two features. That means one sentence to identify a feature, then another to develop it with detail. And then you just need to repeat that process to gain four marks. Pause the video now and have a go. Now's your chance to check your knowledge. On the screen are eight questions with multiple choice answers. You may want to pause the video and have a go at this quiz. On the next slide, the answers will be revealed. Here are the answers to the previous knowledge quiz. You may want to pause the video and mark and correct your answers. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this overview of World War One useful. However, if you want more detail, there are some very detailed videos on the Western Front already on the CHSG YouTube channel.